you do the meeting? Yep, so yeah, so we decided to make this space a flexible space so those doors open up and we'll have the dais here and then seating. I think we'll go ahead and get started if that's all right. Um, so I'm I'm Kathy Gebhardt. For those of you who don't know me, I'm president of the Boulder Valley School Board, and I just am so this excited. This call is now being recorded. That we have all of you here. That you've taken time out of your schedules, and I know some of you just found out about it like a few hours ago, and you still <laughs> showed up. So I'm very thankful. Um, anyway, I think what we'll do is we'll go around and do introductions, and then we'll um, I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent. And really, what we want to we have a. Um, our legislative priorities, we have a few questions that have come up since the legislative priorities document was printed, but we mostly want to just leave this as a dialogue because we want to be a resource for all of you. Um, we know that some of you may or may not have education bills, but when they come across your desk, we really hope you'll reach out to us if you have questions um, because things go really fast and furious once you're down at the Capitol and we know that. So we're deeply appreciative of your service and um, thanks again for being here. So maybe we can start with Representative Bennett over there. It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tracy Burnett. I represent House District 12, which includes uh, Eastern Longmont plus Louisville and Lafayette and all parts in between. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Karen McCormick. I'm House Representative for House District 11, which is Longmont, Niwot, Lyons, Allens Park, and parts north of Boulder. My name is Nicole Rajpal. I'm a new board member representing District B in BVSD, um, which is Northwest Boulder. Kitty Sargent, board member District F, which is South Superior and Broomfield County. Ernestine Mondragon, I'm the lobbyist for Boulder Valley School District and thanks for being here today. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Fenberg and I represent Senate District 18, um, which is the city of Boulder, uh, uh, the mountain towns, western Boulder County, um, and over to uh, Niwot. And I serve as the Senate Majority Leader in the State Senate. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Rob Anderson, Superintendent. Um, in my fourth year as Superintendent here in the Boulder Valley School District. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tammy Story. I represent Senate District 16, uh, which currently includes Southern Boulder County, El Dorado. Um, I mean, sorry, uh, <laughs> mixing up my order. Um, Superior, El Dorado Springs and Eldora, all of Gilpin, uh, the mountains of Jefferson County, and then southwest corner of Denver. I'm Stacy Ziss. BVSD School Board member District D, which is mostly North Boulder, and this is going into my third year of being on the school board. Uh, hi, I'm Judy Amabile, and I represent House District 13, and that is the western part of the city of Boulder, western Boulder County, all of Gilpin, Clear Creek, Grand, and Jackson counties. Happy to be here. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Beth Nisnik. I am a brand new board member. I am part of District E, which is uh, Eastern Boulder as well as uh, Louisville. Great to see you all. I'm Laura Schaefer. I'm the administrative assistant for the Board of Education and for Dr. Anderson, our superintendent. I am happy to be here joining you. And if you ever need anything from either the board or from Dr. Anderson, feel free to reach out to me. Turning it over to Dr. Anderson. I want, want to again just thank everybody for making the time to, to be here. It certainly means a lot to us um, and, and appreciate all of your support. As I look around the room, I see many friends, um, folks that we've been able to work closely with as we've pushed forward some of the priorities of the Boulder Valley School District and um, just want to start by maybe just sharing with you all just a few highlights. I think I have a couple of slides that can kind of highlight some of the work that's happening um, in the school district right now. I would say first and foremost, 
we're still in a pandemic. <laughs> I don't have to tell anybody that. Um, and, and it has been, I, I'm really proud of the way that our district has navigated the, this pandemic over the past couple of years. I think our board has taken a very strong stance around making sure that we follow the health and science, have worked really closely with Boulder County Public Health, Broomfield Health to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep all of our people safe, our kids, our parents, our employees. Um, I would say that if you were to look at the districts in the front range, and um, especially this year, um, look at look at the mitigation efforts that have been in place since day one. I'm just really proud of the things that we've done. We've had let we've had less quarantines than other districts. We've kept more kids in school because we know that's our priority. We want every kid to be in school five days a week, um, and to the greatest extent possible. And so um, I would say that it's been for our teachers. And I'm, I was talking to some of you earlier. This has been a deceptively difficult year. Uh, I think that for a lot of our families, we're working hard to try to get back to normal. We're sending our kids to school each and every day, and our kids are showing up at school um, with, with lots of challenges, right? Some of them socially, emotionally, some of them academically. And I think our teachers are working harder than ever uh, to make sure that we're, we're, we're meeting the needs of each and every one of our kids. And uh, I'm spending a lot of time this year directly in schools. I think I've been to 18 elementary schools where I sit down, I bring them lunch, and we just talk. Uh, it's been a really great way for us to keep our finger on the pulse. So as we're setting policy, um, working on our budgets, we know and understand what our educators need to support our kids. And so, um, but it's been it's, but it's been tough. And I just really want to commend our board of education, who's taken a very courageous stand and not without consequence. I know that um, many of you helped us as we as as board members were um, being recalled. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly the, the amount of, of energy around, around some of this has been challenging, um, but I'm really proud of, of our governance team for standing up and doing the right thing. And so I just wanna thank them all publicly for that and thank you all for your support in regards to that. And so I'm not gonna go deep into our strategic plan. You may have heard of it, if you haven't, it's our All Together for All Students strategic plan. Back in, in 2019, we began to really engage our community in a deep way on what are the things that are going well here in the Boulder Valley School District, just an award-winning school district that's done great things for kids, and where do we wanna get better? And we really focused on something that I think is a challenge for me most districts in the state of Colorado, which is achievement and opportunity gaps. And we really don't feel like we can be the excellent school district that, that we want to be until we have more equitable outcomes and close those gaps. Uh, we have three big outcomes that we're trying to achieve through a set of 13 uh, strategic initiatives. We want to make, make sure that kids are excited about school, that every kid comes to school and is challenged and has relevant educational opportunities. Um, we want to make sure that we equip all of our kids with the skills and resources and supports they need to we, so we can reduce those disparities in both um, growth achievement and opportunity. And that we know that we want kids to, um, to have everything they need to be successful in life after they leave here. And so everything that we're doing is really aligned to Ignite, Equip, Soar. And I have a few highlights I think are leading indicators of the success of our strategic plan and the hard work of our district. Um, one of the things that we've been focusing on um, um, significantly is ensuring that we diversify our workforce, both our teachers and leaders. Um, in the past two years, we've um, increased the number of, of people of color hired by 30% which I think is, is a testament to the work of our HR department and just the work of our leaders really trying to make sure that when a kid comes to school, right, they, there's a higher likelihood um, that they have, um, have a teacher or leader that looks like them and they can relate to. Um, I would say that we're working really, really diligently on making sure that we um, focus on literacy in elementary school to make sure that kids, by the time they get to middle school, are transitioning from learning to read to reading to learn, which is a really important step um, in, in a child's life. And I would say that last year, even amidst a pandemic, um, regardless of the, of the group or subgroup of kids, we were outperforming peers in Colorado in regards to growth. Um, you could see overall our Latinx population and our free and reduced lunch population, and those are our two populations where we've had the largest gap. We're seeing growth above the state of Colorado average, which I'm very proud of. Um, and, and some of you may know that one of our, our most challenged schools, Alicia Sanchez, out in Lafayette, uh, three years ago was, um, in, was in school turnaround 
which is absolutely unacceptable. Um, I'm very proud of, of the work that we've done there. We've invested a lot of resources. We've brought in new leadership. We've given them excellent training. And the growth that we're seeing at Sanchez is even greater than we're seeing as a district in the state, 11 percentage points higher than the state. I'm really proud of the growth of our Latinx students, which is 18 percentage points higher um, than the state average. And for our free and reduced lunch students, a 23 percent um, increase over the state average for free and reduced lunch students across the state of Colorado. Um, so we think that, that it's really um, an opportunity for us to, to, to showcase what can happen when you work together, you embrace your community, um, and, you, and you embrace search what research tells you are the right things to do. Uh, so very, very excited about what's happening at Sanchez. And we're using the lessons that we were learning at Sanchez and scaling those practices to our other schools in a pretty successful way. So, um, and then finally, um, in, in, gosh, two years ago, um, our board, uh, our governance team made the decision to begin to really dig into disproportionate discipline. Uh, the, the, the results that we were seeing were really things we weren't proud about. Um, if you were a student of color, you were two to three times more likely to be disciplined than if you were white. Um, same, same types of trends for students that were on free and reduced lunch. Um, and so we've really tried to change the way that we, we address behaviors that we want kids to learn from and grow from as opposed to have consequences for. Um, and so even in this year, and we are seeing more discipline because of the things that I shared with you all, um, I think the leading indicator that we're very proud of is that we're seeing a, 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 a stronger emphasis on restorative practices and restorative justice, more counseling, more parent engagement, and as opposed to suspending kids and taking their education away from them, we're finding different ways to help support these children and support these kids so they learn and grow from the mistakes they make. Right? That's what as parents we'd all want, right, is that kids learn and grow from our mistakes. Um, and so very, very excited about the work that we're doing there. So those are just a few highlights of what's happening in our school district. Very proud of the work that's, that's going on. A lot of work, a lot of focus, concentration, and our board um, has just been an incredible um, guiding light in regards to what it is that we would that we need to do as a school system. So um, I will stop presenting there. I would say that as, as, we, um, as we head into this legislative session, I hope that you all look at us as a resource, as an asset, as you're trying to gather information to make decisions on what you'll support and, and what you'll push forward. Um, in session, and then also as you all um, have constituents reach out to you, I would ask that, that you um, engage us. I know that I've engaged with several of you all with, with um, issues to get more, more background and information. Um, hand it off to me if, if there's an issue in our school district. We'll have staff work on it, clean it up, and, and, and give you a clean handoff back to you so you know that it's been dealt, dealt with and addressed. Um, and just want to provide that as, as just as, as a partnership opportunity for you all. Um, and then just other than that, just want to thank you all again for being here, for supporting our school district, for supporting the 30,000 students that we have the honor to serve. Um, and just thank you all for your service. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Are there any questions for Dr. Anderson? I think that's pretty amazing, those statistics, given that we were in a, pan a pandemic last year. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about what we see is kind of coming up um, on the landscape going forward. I'm sure it will not surprise any of you that majority of what I've written down has to do with school finance. But the first thing I wanted to talk about is my understanding of what's in the infrastructure bill from the feds is that there is money for lead remediation and lead pipes. And Colorado, maybe you would know or don't know, we had a bill that passed several years ago that was grants to be able to look at what school districts have led in their pipes, but nobody ever applied for the grants because there was no money for remediation. <laughs> um, so I don't think that there have been any s rules set out or how much money is coming, but I'm just hoping, I mean, even I checked with our infrastructure person, Rob Price, and we have lead pipes in our schools. So I'm hoping that Colorado can be at the front of the line <laughs> trying to get some of the, those resources so that we can actually go out and look at some of the lead pipes in our schools because um, I think you would be surprised at all of the remediation <laughs> efforts that superintendents do, which consists mostly of going to school really early in the morning after weekends and holidays and running water to clear out the pipes, because <laughs> that's about all they can do. So, Judy? So I, I was told yesterday or the day before that there's a bill to um, put filters into water fountains that will filter out the lead. And I, I was so shocked by that. Like, 
What about the rest of the water <laughs> that's not in the water fountains? And also, and I was told, yeah, well, we we didn't do any remedi we didn't do any testing because we couldn't do the remediation, and we just didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. And that seems wow. insane. Um, I I will try to moderate my statements, but I do agree with you, and it it also um, carries over to our air quality. Um, we don't test our air quality because we don't have the ability to remediate it. So we used to say a child's education shouldn't depend on the zip code. I would say the water and air should also not depend on the zip code. So I, it's really great that there's money from the feds. There's probably nowhere near enough. I think we'll all be sh shocked at how much lead is out there. But anyway, I just think I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's something whenever we talk infrastructure, it, it seems like it's a good bipartisan place to go and something that I think lots of people can get behind. So. Um, the next thing I was going to raise, and I'm sorry that Senator Kirkmeyer's not here because I think she's going to be taking at least part of the lead on this. I don't know Senator Fenberg or not, but it's on increasing our SPED funding. Um, she, there was some presentations. There was an interim committee on school finance, one of like the, I think we have them every year recently, and um, I think there's been a lot of focus, rightly so, on the underfunding by the state of special education. So we would be happy to help with that. Um, and thinking through that, but we think that's, that would go a long way towards remediating some of the shortfalls we feel in, in overall funding. Um, then there's a shocking presentation by Craig Harper. For those of you who don't know who Craig Harper is, he is the analyst for the JBC for Education. <coughs> Super nice guy. And he talked about how he thinks we can buy down the negative factor over the next two or three years, which was pretty awesome. Now, I know it's going to take a lot of um, prioritization of education, and I know you guys are going to be juggling a lot of priorities this coming year, but it was the first time he's ever been able to say that. And he had a plan for doing that. I know that the concern in the education community is whether we use one-time dollars or ongoing dollars and how fast the local share can make up for use of one-time dollars. But anyway, I think it will not surprise any of you that we would cheer loudly and be very supportive of any attempts to buy down the negative factor. Um, there's also a lot of work around pre-K, and I'm learning a little bit about kind of how hard it is to meld all of the pre-K systems together and try to find the funding. And so um, I can tell you that our staff for pre-K has been involved in all of the task force meetings and could be a resource because I'm just learning about it, but it's, a, it's going to be a heavy lift, and there'll probably need to be legislation around trying to make sure that that goes smoothly. Um, the interim committee is also looking at at risk and new definitions of at risk. And my fear for Boulder is that whatever the new definition is, if we end up showing getting less money from at risk that you would consider hold harmless, at least while you're implementing a new at risk funding formula. Um, sorry, on the at risk. So the interim committee has hired the Urban Institute to do a study on how to revamp our at-risk formula. And they've had a multitude of ideas, but I don't think they've landed on anything yet. And so what I asked is, if they land on something and districts end up getting less money for at-risk students, that there would be some hold harmless. And there's been a past tradition of doing hold harmless when you look at at-risk or when you look at changing funding formulas. Um, I know that Senator Rankin is also looking at trying to figure out a way to do mill levy equalization. Um, of course, the concern there is going to be um, how do you find sustainable funding for that. Boulder has had very generous taxpayers, and we I don't know where we would be if we didn't have our mill levy override. So clearly, we support the ability of districts that don't have the, the local wealth to be able to pass mill levy overrides. It's just a Band-Aid because I think we need to look systemically, but to the extent that we can help sh in the short term with districts that need help with their mill levy overrides, I just I see that coming down the road. Um, then I don't know if any of you know about this, but there is probably going to be an attempt at a ballot measure to change Amendment 23 to change the amount of money that is withheld from income tax and putting that money into the state education fund. So right now, Amendment 23 withholds, if my, ma if I, my memory is right, is about 0.3% of income tax, and it would look at doubling that and then taking that money and putting it into um, the state education fund. There's some conversation about whether that would be a referred measure or whether that would be an initiated measure, but I know they're running language already on what that would look like. So I just want to put that out there because it may come across your plates. 
As you know, we are facing declining enrollment. The state is facing declining enrollment, we heard from Craig Harper, and that presents all sorts of challenges for school districts. And the interim committee also discussed changing the declining enrollment um, calculation, and that would, um, we really hope we don't do that because um, there's a lot of talk about phantom students and a lot of really um, strong language around it without really, I think, fully understanding how important that averaging is for districts that are facing declining enrollment. And our CFO would be happy to provide those kinds of information to you if that becomes a, a question as you go forward. Um, what would it be if we weren't talking about para? I'm guessing there's a $300 million ask out there because we skipped a payment. Um, clearly, we need to get back on track with para. I don't know that there's going to be any conversation this year about the automatic adjustment, but we're, we stand ready to help talk about any things that you want to do around PARA in addition to the $300 million that needs to be made up. Um, then there's a couple bills that we think will be coming back and we don't know what those are going to look like, so we're happy to just be a resource. One is the collective bargaining bill that was brought up last year. We understand it's going to be brought again this year and we're happy to be a resource. We had some concerns about some of the language in that. We have an, an amazingly positive, productive relationship with our union and so we're happy to like, kind of try to be models for that when we figure out what a collective bargaining bill would look like. And then there was the discipline bill. Um, and as you've seen, we have tried to get out in front of that, the discipline issues that are giving rise to some of the concerns statewide around discipline. And I think that our story that we can start to tell around what we're doing around discipline could be a model for having some of those conversations going forward too. So I think that's all I have on my list. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think you probably have a longer list than I do, but <laughs> anyway, a lot of it came out of the interim committee, so I'm not gonna take responsibility for all of it. But anyway, um, is that helpful for, for all of you to, as you can see, a lot of it, almost all of it, you could put under the category of money, unfortunately. Um, so, questions? So I'd just make a comment about the para bill. The 300 million I don't think is set. I think the debate now is whether we just put back what we didn't put in or whether we put back what we didn't put in plus the interest we would have earned. And I would say that is going to be, just from the little bit of listening in I've done, that is going to be a ferocious battle. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think there's almost consensus on the 225. Mm -hmm. Just so, not to scare you too much. The 225, <clears throat> I think, is going to happen. I think it's the debate over the the, miss, the, the lost interest or whatever. Um, I think to, if I was to say right now, I think it's unlikely that that piece will be part of that bill, but I, I think it'll there will be a healthy debate <laughs> <laughs> about it. Um, but the part of the issue is <clears throat> there was a lot of funding that was withheld <laughs> over over the last couple of years, and and I think some folks are just nervous, rightfully so, that if we start calculating interest lost. And, and and you know sort of secondary effects for everything it you know there's a question of like well how far do you go where does that end um, but I do think there's almost unanimous support for the 225 which is great I, I did forget to mention that the US Surgeon General issued a report yesterday about his concerns about mental health and I would be remiss if we didn't talk about that at some point I know I hear from the chitter chatter around that the state is concerned about mental health of our, our teens, um, and there are specific recommendations from the Surgeon General that I meant to print off, but I didn't, and all of them take resources. I know that Representative Mobley is well aware of what's going on in mental health, and so we'd love to be supportive of any conversations around that because it's a, it's a, it's a real issue for sure. Kitty? I want to go back quickly to Para. Is the, is the interest um, conversation, is it an all or nothing? Or is there possibility of some interest? Just curious. It's a good question. I, I think that debate's still to come, to be honest. So um, I, think, I think there probably could be a middle ground to strike. Um, but I, I, I think on this particular issue, it's less about the dollar amount and more about sort of the precedent and the, the um, 
sort of just you know feeling on if if we should entertain the interest conversation or not. Um, so I think for it, it's different for everybody. Um, and at the end of the day, this will be on the Senate and House floor, and we will find out everyone's differences. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, but but I I think it's a good question and something to to explore. Yeah. I also hear rumor, thanks to Ernestine, and, and I'll turn it over to you, about um, some pause in the accountability and assessment bill, and I don't know if there's going to be anything around how much we use um, testing for teacher evaluation. So there's some non-monetary um, issues that I think are going to be really important to address, but I didn't see you, so go ahead. with. No worries. The only other thing I was going to add on para is I think some of the CFOs are really taking a look at the auto-adjust clause. Um, it's going to be really expensive when that kicks in in July, I believe. Um, probably well over a million dollars for Boulder Valley. Uh, so I think there's there's some interest from the CFOs in looking at how we can potentially repair that. But I don't know that it'll come up this session. Just wanted to flag that for you all. Um, yeah, since we're talking about para, I talked to Representative Kip last night. And she is running a bill that is having to do with teach, uh, addressing the teacher shortage and, and the para employees. You're probably aware of that. Um, and some of it is uh, making sure that uh, teachers who are currently retired do not lose their payer benefits when they come back uh, and teach. So just wanted to mention that. Makes sense. We'll look forward to seeing that bill. Questions? I'll just say we really do need to talk about the mental health piece, <laughs> but maybe the not floor, today. The floor is yours for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you all need to get involved with this behavioral health task force. And um, Friday is the last meeting of the year. And um, it's the last meeting before we start to make some actual decisions about how the money is spent. So having somebody show up and put in a plug for extra money to fund the mental health services that we need in schools is something I, I think would be worth your time doing. You can do it online. And um, there are several different buckets of potential spending. And one of them is school-based mental health services. So just to say that as a piece of it, I mean, there's also money for children and youth in beds and in other ways too, but the real nexus with schools is to get more mental health professionals in the school so kids can actually get treatment in school. And some of the schools are experimenting with doing these 15 minute therapy sessions because kids don't actually want to talk for an hour. Uh, but you can get a lot of kids in to be seen if you see them in 15 minute increments. So that was just one of the ideas that came up, but there's been a lot of others. One of the approaches we're looking at, at least out in East County, is uh, the community schools model, which kind of envelops some of the mental health into that, um, because it's really hard to figure out where our ability starts and ends and where that of mental health centers starts and ends. And there's huge gaps in there. I totally get that. Um, and so maybe we can find someone to zoom in on, on Friday. Appreciate the heads up on that. Um, is there going to anything you want to address? Sure. <laughs> um, yes. Well, thanks again for um, hosting this meeting. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, have this dialogue. And uh, I certainly appreciate all the great work that's going on here in Boulder County and the investments that you've made to try and address your achievement gaps and equity gaps and, and all of that really does make a difference. Um, and so that's uh, heartwarming <laughs> that you can make it work here in Boulder. And I know it didn't come without cost, like real financial costs to invest in the, the additional staffing and training and things that you're doing. But um, it's good to know that, that those investments really can work. And I think that's what we need to know as a state, too, that you know, we can't just sort of put some money out there and hope people do something favorable with it. We need real systems that we know are working that others can model after. So I appreciate that as well. Um, 
and then the list of your priorities that um, <laughs> is lengthy and comprehensive, and I'm sure doesn't really cover all the things <laughs> either. But but um, but it's a broad spectrum of issues, and and I appreciate you know hearing about those items as well. So um, I would say in regards to um, just the the nudge about educator assessment processes. Um, that still is very near and dear to my heart, and I um, am so committed to that process. It is so necessary. We, I'm speaking to the choir for those of you that work within the educational system and our school board members and superintendent. Um, we are not going to have a magic wand to magically come up with all the funding to raise educator pay by 10 or 20 percent, you know, and put them in a place where they are getting paid like the professionals they are. And I wish that we could say that we could and sustain that. But um, if we're going to be able to recruit and retain good, solid, qualified educators and make the system work with all the different things that you're talking about that you're, be, you know, you're able to do here in Boulder County, but be able to extend that across the state, we have to do something about educators' environment. It's the only thing that we can do to help encourage them to stay or recruit them and get them to come here. Um, and we are losing that battle. <laughs> You know, before the pandemic, we had 3,000 open teaching positions across the state, and I know it has not gotten better. <laughs> it's gotten dramatically worse because of the pandemic. And if we don't figure out how to improve their environment, then we cannot repair the system for the long haul. And improving their environment means changing how we do educator assessment assessments or how we do, um, you know, ad address educator effectiveness and how we're measuring that. And our current system is really driving teachers out. And we know that. I know that. I think all of you know that. And we have to address that piece of it. And using student growth scores to measure whether a teacher is effective is ridiculous. <laughs> It was ridiculous before the pandemic. It's even more ridiculous now because we have such disruption in our ability to provide stable instruction. Boulder County sounds like has probably done a better job than maybe many of our counties across the state in terms of keeping kids routinely in school, in person for the last two years. You know, it's. It's been all the things, hybrid and remote and combinations of and coming and going between them. And it's just so disruptive. And we're seeing it in kids' behaviors because they've lost touch with what is normal and what is expected in terms of behaviors. And, and that's harsh. And parents, too, are on, upset. So I am very committed to this bill. I think it is imperative that we address how we evaluate educators and do it in a way that we support them and provide them with the tools so that they can build their craft and improve because that's what they want. They want feedback. They're happy to have observations. They want that positive feedback, but they don't want the finger pointing and say, oh my, <laughs> test scores of your students are just horribly bad and you're going to suffer because of it. Because we don't even have valid and reliable, reliable data right now at all, no matter how much we test. We can't consider it valid or reliable and then utilize that bad data to evaluate educators' effectiveness. So I'm here for you. Happy to have that conversation <laughs> whenever you're ready. Stacy, Would the bill you're talking about repeal the previous bill? What is it, 199, whatever um, it was? Um, I would love, there are many people that believe the best thing to do is to repeal 191 in order to um, be able to rewrite the system, but my more recent version didn't go that far, but truly addressed the biggest issue, and that's utilizing student growth scores for evaluating edu educators. Um, but the reality is, is we should. Like, 
the system is not everything that we want it to be, you know. And but I'm happy to hear, you know, and have those conversations with anybody about what you would like to see. Great, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if any of you heard the story on. I get much of my news, I'll admit, to CPR and NPR, and it was a young man down in Campo who um, is a senior and has never had a math teacher, and the starting salary for teachers in Campo is $28,000 a year, and not surprisingly, they are not able to fill positions. So I'm glad you brought that up. I don't think we can solve that easily, but I think we can't lose sight of what the discrepancies are. We. Um, we're lucky because we're a good place to work and people want to work in Boulder, so we don't necessarily feel that in the teaching force. We felt it certainly in bus drivers and other areas, maybe speaking out of school, but um, we are definitely concerned about the pipeline and the ability for, I mean, median price houses in Boulder, you can't be a teacher and buy a house in Boulder. So there's a lot of issues out there around that are embedded in that issue. At the, are there in, anyone, we've, Judy, is there anything else that you wanted to raise? Is there anything else that any of, go ahead, represent McCormick and then Burnett. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a follow-up on when you mentioned um, Craig Harper and the innovative ideas he had around um, the um, BS factor. Can you elaborate on that or, or just share a little information? I'll start and then Ernestine can help me if that's all right. My understanding is because of what we've done with the mill levy stabilization and the increasing to mills to get back to 27 or to um, full funding, the local share is going to be increasing. So my understanding is there's kind of trying to figure out where the local share increases would be able to pick up if we were to use some one-time funding to start to buy that down. And he wasn't really willing to go out more than two or three years in trying to figure it out because, you know, your, your ability to predict gets a lot more wobbly. Um, but that was my understanding is, did I get that close, Ernestine? Yep. And the only other thing I would add is the governor's budget request includes 150 million buy down and I think 400 or 300 million transferred to the state ed fund in one time funds and so that that one time money into the state ed fund will help as a buffer in the out years to pay down that BS factor and I think there was initially a concern about using one time funds but our uh, esteemed JVC analyst thinks it's okay and that if the legislature is strategic in planning what what K-12 looks like in those out years, that they could potentially start really making a dent into the BS factor. And so I think he was just really positive in terms of what the governor has put forward and kind of eased some of our concerns about using one-time funds. Um, so we were pretty happy to hear that. It, it's also been helped by the voters who didn't vote down or voted down the decrease in property taxes and the change in Gallagher. So I think there have been some successes at the ballot that have given us a little bit more stability in our ability to predict local share. And I think those have also helped with just being able to have the conversation, if, if that makes sense. So, so you know, fingers crossed. It, the, the governor's proposal is always welcome. It would just be, it'd be so nice to not have to talk about the budget stabilization factor <laughs> or to at least be, I, I'm sure you guys get it way more than we do. So <laughs> um, anyway. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. And do you think that we could, um, so yeah, it'd be great to get rid of the budget stabilization factor and just not have that as a part of the equation anymore, but then wouldn't it be great to just pay back that $10 billion that we've underfunded K-12 for the last 10 years, you know, sort of but like interest. Kind of, I was going to say that slippery slope that Senator Penberg talked about. <laughs> There's lots of places we could find those. But, and you should all be proud of me. I didn't even mention best. Um, Representative Burnett. Um, so welcome, Representative Hooten. Thank you for coming. I'm glad to be here, and I apologize uh, for being so late. 
we go. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much uh, for hosting this, and I apologize for being late. Um, I think I walked around the building twice before I realized that <laughs> twice I had walked right by the main entrance. Um, but getting your steps in early. Here I am. Yes, I actually have done quite well on my steps so far this morning. Uh, but I'm very glad to be here, and I appreciate the work that the Boulder Valley School District does. Um, I mentioned this yesterday when we were meeting, we had our legislative meeting with the Boulder City Council. Um, how fortunate our delegation is to have such a, um, a good relationship with our local electeds, uh, including obviously the school board, and uh, how um, aligned our thinking is. And we have our colleagues. So I'm um, very happy to be here. And of course, we do everything we can um, at the state level to support you and the school board and delighted that um, one of the ballot initiatives was defeated <laughs> and um, I hope that you are too. So anyway, thanks for having me. Well, it, it goes both ways, Representative Hooten. We are so fortunate to have all of you who I think it's much easier to be in alignment when we communicate and we um, have kind of singular focuses of supporting our schools and that can take lots of different shapes and sizes, but bye kitty. Um, anyway, so thank you very much to all of you because you really do um, make it a lot easier for us when we know we can reach out to you and you'll get back to us and we'll have thoughtful um, conversations. And, and thanks to Ernestine for keeping us all informed and <laughs> going along because I don't know what we'd do without her. So um, are there, I'll keep the floor open. Are there, do you have anything? Um, I, I would just say on the... Um Collective bargaining uh, topic. Let's definitely chat more about it. Um, I'm, I'm working on it a little bit from the Senate side, um, but it's it's really mostly um, Majority Leader Escar, who's kind of running point on it right now in the House. But um, I I do think it, it it will be interesting to have a discussion about how it um, how how Boulder's experience has been and how a bill like this could impact um, uh, Boulder Valley. I think. It, there's been such a strong relationship with the union here, um, and also a really positive relationship uh, with your charters. Mm -hmm. And I think those two pieces will be relevant um, data points, right? Because this not only could impact uh, relationships with um, with the union, but also with uh, the district charters. So something to um, plant a flag and let's make sure we have that conversation because I think it'd be really helpful for us. And Senator, CEA has reached out. They've had one meeting with us, and we anticipate a new bill draft in, a, yep. in the next week, and they'll have another one. So I think there was some disappointment in the first draft that it was exactly the same as last year's. So I think we definitely have a lot of, we need to read through that. And They, they spent a lot of time on it in the interim, redrafting it. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out they just literally redrafted it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yes, there's, I think there's definitely a lot more conversations to happen before there's anything ready for prime time. If I remember, part of the concern was the breadth of it too, and who, like you say, the charters and who they were going to be including in the requirements for collective bargaining. Yeah, and, and the challenge is that it, it is not a uh, collective bargaining for school districts bill. It is a collective bargaining for everybody bill. And so therefore, it's hard to write it to apply appropriately to the different types of employers, right? And so I think that's one of the challenges. And I think we just need to figure out how to strike the right balance between um, not leaving it too vague so that there's just disputes all the time in the future because the law is silent, but also um, you know, being broad enough to allow it to apply to such different situations across the state. Any other hot topics? Kathy, do we want to open it up um, to see if anyone's running any K-12 legislation that, or rumored bills? Well, we... Yes, yeah, speaking of school finance, 
um, I am bringing forward as my first bill a um, measure to make sure that the School Finance Act gets passed before the long bill uh, shortly after the March economic forecast so that school districts across our state um, can have a clearer picture of what their budgets are going to be. You can move a little more effectively to your hiring um, plans. And then uh, if there happens to be extra money, um, it's easy enough to run an additional bill if needed uh, to add to that. But um, this is something that is coming from the St. Frame Valley School District. I know you are aware of. Um, Brandon Schaefer uh, brought it forward. And um, we are getting very positive reactions across the state on, on this measure. And, and as you know, historically, the School Finance Act, when it was pulled out of the long bill years ago, was set to be passed first um, because we as a state set pu public education as a priority and we wanted that reflected in how we spend our money. And so this measure is really just to get it back to the way it was. So there's no more shenanigans and kicking it down, kicking the can down the road. So um, I will bring that forward once we um, are passing around our draft so that you can take a look at that. It's, it's exciting because I think pre when the, the way we're currently doing it, where it's now it's just a number in the long bill, I'm hoping it will allow for some more robust conversation or like you suggest around K-12 and our prioritization of K-12. Senator? Uh, yes, I'm running a bill. This again came from uh, Brandon Schaefer and uh, St. Frank Valley School District and it's a, it's a procurement, procurement bill that should help save schools money and protect data privacy. Um, and uh, there's a lot of times there's contracts that uh, large vendors like oh, Salesforce or whatever, um, school districts um, want to use their, their applications. But the contract is, um, if there's any issue, uh, the contract is, is, is done such that you have to sign, um, uh, let me put it this way. So um, the laws of another state are the ones that apply rather than here in uh, Colorado. And a lot of times um, large schools that have uh, lawyers on hand cannot sign those kind of contracts. And so you lose out of a lot of competitive contracts. And also things like, um, um, but smaller schools that may not notice these clauses, they're at risk. So what this bill is doing, it, it's um, allowing that um, for all K-12 contracts, automatically we include uh, that is governed by, these contracts are governed by Colorado law and that there's governmental immunity and also confidential data is protected by and in Colorado laws apply. So it will save money hopefully and open up some competition, especially for places like Boulder Valley. It sounds like it should be easy, but there never is such a thing. <laughs> well, well, it's my pre-file. That's awesome. <laughs> Any other K-12? Thank you. Um, so I am looking at a um, early childhood workforce diversity bill, which, you know, you might think it's not a K-12 bill, but actually it is <laughs> because um, because it would be it would start out as a pilot program and hoping that this would um, actually be effective and and then you know we could expand it but um, the idea or the 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 driver is that one we have you know a really small early childhood workforce in the state we have not been able to do that well and it's primarily I would guess because we don't pay early childhood workers very well, even worse than K-12, which is hard to believe. And, um, but we also are lacking significantly in diversity in that workforce, especially when you are looking at lead teachers or owners or managers of those programs. Um, generally, people of color are working the lowest level of employment in that field. And 
you know, across the board, it's hard to uh, find sustainability in terms of financial sustainability in that career field because the pay is so low. So, you know, I'm hoping as all of this effort is gelling and there are more federal dollars coming for early childhood that um, we are going to be able to increase pay um, in that career field. But um, the bill, again, is about uh, applying diversity you know, in that workforce. And you certainly recognized it by the slides that you, you know, showed earlier about having diversity here in um, Boulder County as well, um, schools. And so it would start in, in the K-12 realm in high school, um, particularly in high schools that have, uh, you know, a heavy population of um, people, of students of color, also in communities where, um, you know, it's a high percentage of free and reduced lunch. Um, and it would be a pilot program that is potentially a three-year program in high school, starting out in sophomore year, where there would be um, a particular curriculum for just child development, you know, zero to 18 um, during that year. And then the next year in junior year, um, utilizing an on-site preschool program that is already established where students would have one class where they go to that preschool program and do, you know, student teaching, if you will, um, for that one class period. And then senior year, it would be expanded to potentially a two or three credit uh, program for a high school student where they would spend two to three credit hours in that established program where they are taking on more of a lead role. They're there for a more established period of time. They have more under their belt, you know, and can um, be more integrated in that system. And then there would be a seamless transition to an institution of higher ed into a preschool education program. Um, and along the way, in all of this too, a business component with business management, entrepreneurship, you know, skills, teaching them because it's not just about it's not just about being the educator. It's about running the program, owning the program, and so that would carry on into the higher ed component as well. So this is a multi-year process, and and the idea is not just getting a credential, but getting a degree. That, that would be the driver, potentially a dual degree so that they really can walk into that field and be at the top of their game and run those programs in those communities where they don't have them. And, um, you know, and so anyway, that's the, that's the gist of the bill. I'm happy to chat with any of you about it at any time and hear what your thoughts are and what we can do to make it better. But um, I think it's important and I hope by the time we are, um, you know, reaching the end of this process, which potentially is seven years for a student, that we will have better pay <laughs> established in that career field so that we're not setting them up for, you know, a career where they can't survive financially, so. Any others? I forgot to mention it really quickly on the pre-K. The concern that we have is that they're melding funding sources to try to come up with enough money to offer a robust program. And by doing that, they're taking our CPP money. And so we won't be able to serve with that money our at-risk three-year-olds. And we have we don't have a lot of at-risk three-year-olds, but the ones we have are at risk and have many risk factors. And we will, we will continue to serve them um, because we have a mill levy that we passed that allows us to use some of that money, but I think it's a concern across the state. So those are some of the things that we need to look at when we're looking at how we're going to put this preschool program together. Um, is you know serving four-year-olds is a worthy goal, but then are we doing it at the expense of our our at-risk three-year-olds? And then we also have the whole issue around SPED and the requirement that we have to serve um, SPED children with disabilities in early childhood. So those are some of the issues that would come up. Were you going to say something, Senator? Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was just going to say on, on that topic, um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll probably be running the preschool implementation bill coming out of the, the task force. Um, I ran the, 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 the bill, I guess, a year ago. Um, I don't know if it was one session ago or two sessions ago now, but 
Um, uh, so happy to chat about that and make sure that we do it in a way that um, Boulder Valley is supportive of. I know a lot of work has gone into it. Um, there's been a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, and a lot of concerns have been raised. Um, so I think now is where we get to the refining phase and figure out what the bill actually is going to end up being. But happy to have all of those conversations offline. It's, it's truly exciting. It's just figuring out how we pay for it ongoing yeah. for sure. Ernestine, Representative Putin. Uh, Kathy, and I'll just mention, um, I'm not, I won't be running uh, any, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, <laughs> K through 12 bills uh, this upcoming session. But I did have a, uh, a very interesting conversation last night with the chair of uh, the House Education Committee, Barbara McLaughlin, and because uh, I just wanted to get her take on what 2022 is going to look like um, and you know she shared a lot of information with me and uh, but one of the things that you may or may not know is that she and Senator Sonnenberg um, are running a bill together um, that would allow um, retired teachers who come back to work to work more to not risk their para benefits by working more. Did you already mention that? Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm sorry, I missed no, that part okay. of the conversation. It's, it's, a, it's important. And yeah. Dale McCall has been trying to run that bill, and we have a smaller version of it for yeah. rural schools, and I think it's um, it's great. And the first bill, if I remember, it was more so it didn't impact their para benefits, and so this is so it doesn't impact their Social Security benefits, if I'm understanding. Right. So I'll be supporting that bill. Yeah, we'll support anything to and, get and, qualified and, teachers and out. We'll and we'll keep the cheat sheet very close <laughs> <laughs> about what we will and will not be supporting. <laughs> and, Thank and, you. This is helpful. And we'll Saves reach us out a lot to of time. us when you have a question. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure no one will be super upset if we end it early, but I just want to make sure there's nothing else uh, that anyone wants to raise. Um, this has been super helpful, I think, for us at least to know um, what you all are thinking and um, to actually be able to meet in person is super fantastic. Um, so is there anything else for the, the good of the meeting? Um, otherwise, I'll give you 15 minutes back of your, oh, sorry, Dr. Anderson. I, I just want to say thank you all again to everyone. And as, as session starts, uh, we, we understand information comes at you fast and furious. Uh, Ernestine has my cell number and I, she knows where I live. Uh, she can she can get a hold of us really quickly if you want to know kind of what our position is on things as they evolve and just give you kind of our perspective on how we feel like it would impact our school district. Um, so no need to, you know, if, if it's fast and furious and, and you're trying to get information, Ernestine uh, knows how to get a hold of us and all the key members on our team. Um, you know, our CFO is, is a leader amongst um, CFOs in the state and the nation. He's the president-elect of ASBO, which is the Business Officials Association for, um, it's an international organization, and, and just incredibly competent and understanding of those types of issues. Um, and we've tried to just take leadership issues across the state um, uh, on these types of, you know, on, 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 um, on education-related issues. So we'll have great perspective to help inform you as you make decisions. Uh, but Ernestine, I'm, I'm guessing Ernestine, you know how to contact everyone and they know how to contact you, if I'm, I'm getting that right. So um, we're, we're happy to meet and for more in-depth conversations prior to, but when session hits and things start to change and evolve, please um, utilize Ernestine. We are here to help serve you and, and help you give the information that you need to make great decisions. So I just wanted to thank you and just, just remind everybody of that. Thanks, everyone, and happy holidays. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I just thought of uh, two quick things. I was just quickly reviewing this. I just want to say um, your last point on, on vaping. Um, the city of Denver just banned flavors yeah. in the whole city, which is a pretty huge step um, for the state, I think. And um, I think that move means that it's much more likely the state will now do it for the whole state. For, at the legislature will do it for the state. Um, so I do know that there is like a, I, I don't know even who, who's sponsoring it, but, but I met with the advocates and, and it is coming. Um, so that'll be a bill this year, which I think will be um, really important uh, for K-12. 
Uh, and then the other um, smaller issue, but wanted to just put it out there for, for, for conversation later, is the governor's air quality uh, budget proposal um, includes uh, a, a good amount of money for uh, electrifying school buses. And so um, we're still talking about how it would be implemented, but it would be funding directly for school districts for when you are replacing, you know, naturally replacing um, parts of your fleet. And, and I think the idea is that the state would pay for the delta of the, the cost increase of an electric school bus versus a diesel bus that you would have bought anyways because of retirement of older ones. So something to talk about to make sure it's implemented in a way that actually is useful. We, we, we actually had the governor up here riding right, our first right, electric the, the bus right? that apparently for liability reasons we could just drive around the parking lot. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it was well, it, a, it was amazing to be standing next to a school bus and have it be on and not silent, like need. Yeah, yeah, it was really pretty cool. I, I think it also it, it's it's cool. I think there's like an educational component to it that's important um, in the school setting, but it's all it's also um, I think it, there's there's a strong equity issue, uh, right? Because of um, those diesel fumes being in so many lower income and underrepresented communities, and um, I, I think I think it's it's it could feel like a gimmick and like, you know, like a kitschy thing. Um, but I actually think it's very important for several reasons and, and I'm excited about it. So I want to make sure it's something that's easily implemented by the district. So happy to chat more. And, and I think we'd be great partners on both issues. I think that our, our board took a stand um, and worked with, um, you know, our local officials here in Boulder to, to do a lot of this, um, you know, the banning flavors. And, uh, and we do, we are part of a, um, a lawsuit against Juul. Um, amongst a lot of other districts across the country, um, and then uh, um, we have uh, we have some staff um, that are aligned to our sustainability work. That, um, if you were to ask the governor, they. They, they took the majority of his time while he was riding the bus to, to share with them our, his passions so we can certainly help on both issues. Yeah. Rob, do you want to give some background on what we've done with electric school buses? For, for the well, well, we had the first electric school bus in the state. And um, I think that this has been a priority for us, and certainly, um, I believe we have um, six. That we're our, our next purchase will be six school buses, um, um, matching, uh, you know, you know, utilizing grant funding to try to help kind of some of the delta. I, I, they do cost more; they're more to insure. They have a limited range, um, but there's so many benefits that, that that we know of. And so, um, again, I think that we were one of the leaders in the state of Colorado on this, and so happy to connect you all to the right members of our staff on the operations team and transportation team. Um, and bus drivers love them, so um, yeah, happy to help in any way. Yeah, I just I just like to point out too. I was on that right around the <laughs> right around the parking garage with, the, and um, uh, I think that this will really help with school budgets in the future because of the reduced fuel costs. Um, I have had a conversation with the Boulder Valley, um, uh, the um, Boulder County Sheriff, and they have their first EV, and they did a com uh, they did a uh, comparison compared to an, uh, a regular SUV, and there's significantly more lifetime savings, cost savings, because so much of the time uh, they spend their time uh, just idling. And that's a lot of fuel costs. And so I hope that as we go forward that you will see the same thing with the electric school buses as well. I, I love the conversation, but I am curious what their range is. Like, you know. 93 miles. <laughs> okay. And, and what's the average number of miles the school bus travels? Like 150 in their route? I'm just. All electric buses travel less than 93 miles. <laughs> we, we uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there are limiting factors, and I think that there's limits as you get into the mountains and some of that terrain, for sure. Um, but as the, uh, you know, and charging and, and where do you, uh, you know, where your bus terminals are and how you charge them. And, and, and so, again, I think that everyone, every fleet um, in, in most school districts would have a use. I mean, they might not be able to go all electric today because of, of some of the limitations, but I would imagine that that technology will continue to evolve, right? The, the 93 miles is the average a uh, school bus goes a day, or is that? That's the electric bus. The electric, the electric bus, bus will go range. 93 miles on a charge. It does, yes, yes, no. Yeah, no, we don't run it and then have a diesel bus pick the kids up. <laughs> halfway there. 
Yeah, it does. For many of our routes, it works re ju really just fine. <laughs> Two electric buses for every route. I apologize for bringing up the school bus issue. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Dr. Anderson was right. We have a, an employee who is passionate about this and knows everything there is to know about it. And so we're happy to loan him um, <laughs> because no, it was it was truly wonderful to see his passion and interest and knowledge. So um, if we can be helpful, we'd love to. All right. So I didn't give you back 15 minutes. Five minutes. Any anything else for the good of the order? All right. Thank you all. I wish you all the best and we'll see you soon. <laughs>